and begin. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our first talk of our um, spring series. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, this afternoon Lee, Luca Di Mascolo, uh, who is uh, currently at the University of Trieste uh, in Italy. And he earned his PhD at the Max Planck Institute um, in Munich and has been working on the SE effect uh, for many years. So we are really looking forward to talk today. Please take it away, Luca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. So I forgot to add like, you know, um, a thing in this first slide. So I'll just uh, say this first, like uh, many of the results, like, you know, especially like, you know, toward the end of this talk, um, I really just, you know, a common F like between like uh, many of us, like from Mustang to Emily is one of uh, the people like working on this and like this, a few people yeah, so, um, in the audience. And it's really like, you know, thanks to everyone that's not like, you know, only my work. So it's nice because we're slowly building a community of SD science. But you know, let's get it started. Um, I think like you know, uh, the very first you know starting point for like you know really getting like you know, what we're talking about when like you know, dealing with galaxy clusters. Uh, and this is not working. Okay, now yes. Um, so galaxy clusters. If you just take like a random paper from the archive, I guess you will probably see like you know the sentence the, the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. And this is kind of like, you know, really key to why we need to study galaxy clusters. Um, and so basically they're really the very end of the hierarchical formation of structures on large scales in the universe. And this is a simulation of what happens across cosmic time. Um, this is from the last year's TNG uh, simulation. And it's basically like tracing how we get like from a cosmic web of, um, small scale um, structures and objects to really massive systems like galaxy clusters. You can see that you have basically a lot of accretion from the surrounding of material. You have like, you know, galaxies are infolding in the systems um, and you have mergers. Uh, this kind of like, you know, kind of a key word for today's talk. Um, and it's a slow assembly and really just, you know, understanding like how like cluster forms and how they evolve is you're like tracing how, uh, you know, the universe evolved. And these are kind of like, you know, what we can do with galaxy cluster and why we need to study them. They're definitely like, you know, at the end of formation of like, oh, structure for all large scale structures, meaning that, you know, they're really tracing how the universe is composed of. And uh, they're also the largest like, you know, um, uh, ball of plasma that we have in the universe, meaning that you can really like test a lot of interesting plasma effects um, on scales that are not accessible on earth for sure. Um, and, and also this kind of like, you know, really, um, uh, important point. I'm, I will not touch this in the talk, but it's important to like mention it. It's, it's also the environment where like in a lot of, uh, galaxy evolution happened. Um, and it's really important to like, you know, understand how the environment is really like affecting galaxy evolution, but also the other way around how galaxies are really, you know, shaping their morphology, um, of the SEM. Um, and the thing is like, you know, of course, like if we just zoom in, we find it like you know, life of um, um, galaxy clusters is really, really messy. Uh, we, we saw like there, there are a lot of mergers going on and you know, this kind of like, you know, D merger that we probably, most of you know, um, this is a bullet cluster. We only see in red here, like, you know, the gas is being like, you know, shocked and heated um, and we'll get back to this later. Uh, but also we can see here, like for example, dark matter, uh, like in this blue part here basically is most of the mass of the cluster. And it was telling us that you have that the dark matter is not interacting um, with like, you know, with uh, gas and like, you know, burning matter and with dark matter, if not um, by gravitational um, force. So uh, it's really like, you know, kind of the key result and probably why the bullet cluster is famous, but uh, it's also, you also have a lot of other effects. Like this, for example, one of the, uh, what, what we can probably see, uh, I'll probably mention during the talk, is like sloshing of gas. So when you don't have like, you know, clusters just really going one um, against the other, uh, you will probably kind of like have a gravitational kick in the um, intercluster media and they will just start to just move around the gravitational well. And the typical image it's used is for the discovery is like, you know, when you have the glass of wine and you just move it around. Um, of course, you have also a lot of like all these phenomena just injecting turbulence into the, um, the gas and just, you know, filling the volume 
of uh, galaxy clusters and um, really just you know, shaving it, like, you know, and shaving like physical and thermodynamic, thermodynamic properties on very small scales. And then they just, you know, draw all, a lot of other effects, but one of the most important to cite here is like, you know, the effect of AGN that are sitting like in the BCGs, in the brightest cluster galaxies at the center of clusters. Um, what we know is that like, you know, uh, AGN have a very important like a role in like in a really sustaining uh, galaxy cluster because otherwise it will just collapse, it will just radiate away energy and it will not have for all the galaxy clusters. Um, and this actually, you know, I mean, like to the to the way we observe galaxy cluster, the thing is like, you know, when we just look in the direction of a galaxy cluster, we, we see a lot of intercluster medium, which is like, you know, really hot, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin plasma. And um, it's really hot and it's just emitting um, radiation, like you know, X ray radiation through like BAM strolling emission. This is just an image, for example, of uh, the Coma cluster, which is the nearest cluster we have. Um, around and um, this is an image actually superimposed like an HST image we're imposed on, uh, sorry, SDSS image. So we impose um, um, by like a NIXMM uh, map of the intercluster medium. And it's interesting like, you know, to uh, think about this because this is like X-ray observations were like really the bulk of the observation we use for understanding how galaxy cluster evolve and how the you know, intercluster medium behave and like the, all the complex interactions between like, you know, merger activities and AGNs and accretion. Uh, and it's like a beautiful image of actually a cluster that I showed before, um, which is Perseus um, showing all the cavities which are generated by the AGN um, and like all this washing going around. Um, true X observation, what we are doing is basically measuring density and, and through spectroscopic analysis, we can also get information on temperature. Um, the thing is, like, you know, so the, just, you know, talking about X-rays, of course, and it's like, you know, in the title, there was, like, you know, mentioned to the SD effects of why we're here. The thing is, like, um, draw limitations. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, this is observation of fundamental for galaxy clusters because it's really, like, you know, the way we, can, we got really where we are at the moment, like, you know, in terms of, like, understanding ITM physics. Um, but for example, if we move to higher redshift, this is something, this is how um, a galaxy cluster will appear. Um, this is a cluster, you know, that I will, um, we'll talk about like later in the, in the talk. But what's important here is that it's basically just a bunch of photons. Um, there are a few reasons for this, and there are also a few other uh, important points to make about X-ray. So the, the thing is like, you know, as any resource, like when we move, um, um, to like you know high redshift or so distant system, uh, we have the surface brightness just affected by cosmological dim uh, dimming. Basically, you know, for this exactly the same cluster just moved far away, we have a the number of photons we are re receiving is just on scale that is like you know um, one plus z to the minus four. Um, so it's it gets really hard to really trace like you know, a uh, high redshift system like you know and go beyond basically one. Uh, it's really challenging. My point, and this is kind of important for like, you know, uh, what we'll see later. Um, you may have limitation in understanding like, you know, how, what's the temperature inside this, these systems and meaning that, you know, it's going to be really hard also to kind of like deproject in a correct way density and, and get like, you know, robust thermodynamic, thermodynamic information. And this becomes harder and harder as we move um, up in redshift once again. And also, this is kind of like a technical thing, but I'm a really fan of like you know telescopes that you can you know go there and touch. Um, so like you know going for observing X-ray observation uh, for having X-ray observation, you really need to go to space, um, which you know complicates things a little. So there is a way for like, kind of like you know circumventing this problem, not really solving them uh, because it's really just looking at a complementary view, um, and it's true that as the effect. You know, which um, I I meant like at the very beginning in the title and like through like a few slides. So the SCF um, is basically like you know a shadowing of the CMB by intercluster medium. This is also the reason of the title. Um, what we have is basically is the inverse Compton scattering of CMB photons of the electrons that are inside like the the, the clusters, um, and this actually you know provide like one of the you know uh, I think it's probably 
my favorite property of this effect, which is um, the rest surface brightness of the SD effect in the direction of a galaxy cluster is not dependent on the redshift. So if you just take the exact cluster and just move it like you know, uh, in the universe, you are not going to see any effect. So meaning that basically have no virtual, uh, virtual no, virtually no limit in the in the rest that we can actually you know target with the Z effect. And now I have like you know um, like you know mention one important thing. I'm talking about like like the synodal large effect here, but to be really honest, this should be actually the synodal large effects. Um, the reason is like you know basically what we have is depending on the velocity distribution of the electrons in the in the clusters, we have different contributions. Um, so when we just take into account like the thermal population of electrons, so the one in our internal equilibrium will basically going to get um, uh, um, and the effect is probing pressure, and then it's fully complementary to what we have from X-ray, which is mostly going for density. Um, but if you actually take into account the fact that you know electrons are pretty hot, so there should be a relativistic effects, um, we can actually get information on the temperature of these electrons, and this is also really important because meaning that basically if we had enough information as the effect, we could actually really get the full thermodynamic picture of the galaxy cluster. Um, but then we also have motion of like, you know, the, the cluster itself and also part of it. And it's introduced an additional effect, which is the kinematic one. And finally, we also have, for example, uh, the cavities that are inflated by agents or filled maybe by non-thermal electron or like electrons are not in thermal equilibrium, just mostly cosmic rays. And it could introduce an additional effect. But this is just important to just keep in mind, like, you know, probably, hopefully we're going to get this, but at the moment, I will just mention like, you know, the thermal as the effect as the only as the effect. And this is going to be like the rest of the talk. Um, and finally, you know, there's like an important property here that was like, it's used in general which is the dependence, dependence of the SD effect on frequency. Since this basically is an upscatter of uh, the CMB photons uh, due to interaction with the electrons in the SEM, uh, we have like, you know, a shift of, in the energy. And this causes a very peculiar spectral dependence of the effect, which makes it like really easy to understand when we're like looking at the Z effect in the sky uh, and it's not like you know, something else. So this is you know, the, the, the cure that we see really is a spectral distortion in the direction of the cluster compared to like, you know, um, CMB black body. And it's just what an effect on a real cluster that was observed by Planck. Uh, and basically we see that moving from low frequency uh, to high frequency, we just go from um, observing a decrement in the direction of um, CMB in the direction of a galaxy cluster. So basically like, you know, negative flux, if you remove the zero uh, value, uh, we pass from like a region where we have zero as the effect um, going from like a region where basically the, the, elegant, the photons has been upscattered and just produce like, you know, a, a positive signal. Um, and this is really just, you know, the, the, the main properties that basically have been used like in the past and like are used today for like, you know, uh, really, targeting the effect and the reason why we're just using the effect for using galaxy clusters. Um, this is one of the first map, I think, uh, I mean, <laughs> as far as I know, of the effect like on, on the sky this is um, almost a full sky map from Planck and just zooming in because resolution is not that great. All these tiny points here are basically galaxy clusters. Um, so it works, we can really use that for uh, tracing. Um, you know, large, large scale structure. And indeed, this is what we have basically now. This is like a, a complete uh, plot with all the clusters we know today uh, through the SD effect. In green is Planck, yellow is the latest release from Actin, red is the SPT uh, down in the south uh, pole. And this is basically extending from redshift zero up to redshift roughly two. We're really getting like you know a lot of clusters, and it's really working. It's really allowing us to really trace what's going on in the universe, and the like you know number of clusters and like you know their mass. But there is a thing. This is an image of a galaxy cluster observed by Planck, and it's pretty different from what we could you know see with X-ray and what we you know what I showed like you know before, um, and you know. I will say it's really hard to do like, you know, ICM studies with this. It's a nice result, of course, still, 
we can trace like everything like you have Rashi two and is amazing, but that's kind of it. Um, and okay, we 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 moved forward compared to Planck, and uh, we actually had the Lagrange cosmology telescope and the South Pole telescope, and this is what we have. So we move from pixels to smaller pixels. Uh, of course. Uh, the main goal of like you know this telescope was not to really get into decium physics probably and was more really to trace um, the distribution of clusters in the universe but still you know we'll really like to get into using the z effect for doing icm physics um and i don't know um if you know which cluster is this i don't know if you have any ints but you know if you um you know can you imagine that so this is the bullet cluster. Um, here it is. So you know, pretty hard to find like you know, how that this is actually the famous bullet cluster. Um, we have to go for high resolution. We have to go for that. Um, so in my past, what I uh, almost use like you know, as facility for really getting into like the tiny details of the Z effect um, uh, is all my something I'm really using uh, right now too. Um, just to let you understand what we can do with Alma, I would just go through a, two examples. Um, I just keep the details. I'm pretty sure you can like, kind of come here with like radio interferometers and how they work and how we can do, why we have resolution. Um, and I will start from this one. This is um, a pretty massive high redshift uh, cluster. This is SPT 10106, redshift 1.13. Um, and this is a composite image, like you know, there is uh, HST, like you know, in the background. And in red is, um, uh, the, the, the X-ray emission, and in yellow is the SE, but we'll get there in a bit. It's kind of like a spoiler, what I'll say in a, in a bit. Um, the thing is like, you know, so this cluster was discovered for the first time by SPT. This is like the map, um, the original map. In this case, as I mentioned before, of course, it's really hard to tell what's going on in this cluster. Um, and on the right, there is the, the Chandra image. Um, this is the same cluster as like at the very beginning saying, okay, look, X-ray observation could be really tricky. Uh, anyway, it's not like, you know, um, it's really hard to get like a lot of photons for high redshift systems. And this is kind of like, you know, sum summarizing like the, the, yeah, where we were like, you know, before this study. Like, you know, we have like real low resolution observation from SZ side and, you know, limited observation from the X-ray. Um, and together with these, actually, they're like, you know, there were problems understanding what was going on in this specific system, because like, um, first of all, we definitely see that, you know, this is the position of the brighter cluster galaxy. And we definitely see an excess of photons like of emission in the direction of the BCG, well, near the BCG, which is general, like, you know, typical for uh, relaxed systems where we know that basically the, the gas had time to just you know, really, um, yeah, relax fully and start to like, you know, fall into the additional well and just emit, um, X-ray photons um, to get yeah, solving as I mentioned before. Um, and in fact, if you just you know, do um, a study of the temperature in this system, we just see that in this region, we have lower temperature than like really low temperature compared to like the rest. Um, and also there are like a few um, uh, indication that offer the presence of X-ray cavities. So this is also really, you know, something we see uh, when we have a really active AGN, it's also, um, and when these are not being disrupted by, for example, like you know, merger events. But at the same time, talking about merger, we definitely see that the distribution of the SEM is really asymmetric, which is something that we, we see in merging systems because we have like a lot of disturbance in morphology. And if you just take like the velocity distribution of the galaxy members uh, in the system, we really have a very skewed distribution. So not like a Gaussian and very uh, regular one. Plus, let's complicate things a little bit. If we just take the weak lensing map uh, of, this, this, of this cluster, so just you know, tracing the mass distribution within the system, we clearly see two peaks here. So one is roughly coinciding with the, with the main core, and the other one you know, coinciding with the extent uh, on the south. But that's not it. <laughs> we can add like kind of radio data at this point. Um, so this is an, an image from ASCAP EMU. We definitely see that there is a really active uh, AGN, like you know, coinciding with the BCG uh, here. But also, this is the regional map. Uh, we can definitely see some um, extended structure around. 
So what we try to do is actually to remove the, the emission from the BCG. And this is what we saw. Um, basically, after subtraction of the point source, like in the direction of the BCG, we saw like an extended signal uh, with a morphology was roughly coinciding with the X-ray emission. This is kind of what we see for like you know nearby systems and when they're like you know merging and generating like you know radio halos. But finding a radio halo at this threshold, this is like a threshold of one point or T, and it will be really you know um, kind of like you know novelty. It will mean that basically the magnetic field was like you know strong enough, really just not sustain this, but also uh, for not letting like you know radiative cooling just you know. Uh, make it like the halos were fading soon. So it's kind of, you know, it will be like, it would have been like a really nice result. And I said like, what would have been? Because actually, if we just add resolution, uh, we see that the picture is like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, more normal, I would say, but still, there are a few important uh, things here. Um, the point is that basically what we saw is that um, there is definitely like an extended structure connected with BCG, potentially associated with, um, um, uh, radio jet. Uh, the thing is, like you know, it's not clear, for example, whether this part here is connected to the rest or not. And if so, that will mean that we would definitely need a mechanism for like you know making this bright in radio um, over this length. This is like you know 200 kiloparsec. That you know, given the rest, is, like it, it's really hard to like you know sustain and make it bright. Um, but on the other hand, there is no uh, correspondence with uh, secondary BCG. They will like you know really hint to the presence, for example, like or like to the presence of a galaxy, you know, the BCG. They will hint to a connection between like you know secondary G and there. Um, but I guess like this kind of like you know probably something that probably <laughs> um, that Emily will enjoy. It may be that what's happening here is that it's really that we have some triggering on you know the radioactivity uh, in the system due to the merger. But we kind of like you know still in the position that we can't tell a lot because we still have. Uh, missing information on the dynamical state of the system. We have like a mixed information. That's where the SD comes in. Um, so we targeted this observation. Uh, we, we used this observation for the for SP2106 to really uh, try to model the distribution pressure. What we saw is that there are two very distinct peaks in the SC distribution. We can see like one is here, the one is here. This is the position of the BCG, just for reference. Um, so. What's important from this slide is that you can definitely see there are two well-defined peaks here. So this one too is the model, it's just the residual, just to show that everything is working fine. And I tried really hard to just fit this as a unique halo. So just you know, a simple one, really, really hard. I didn't manage. So basically every time like it was statistically, the two halo model was statistically favored by like roughly 10 sigma over like the single halo one. So there were, you know, what I thought is like really that like two halos, but what's interesting here is not by the fact that there are two separate halos alone, but uh, what happens when we just you know put this piece into like you know the world puzzle? So this is just the the, the contours here, basically the, the contours we get from uh, the Z model, and uh, behind here is like is the filtered view after applying alpha just function, um, and. What we can see for, for sure, like you know, quickly, is that a we definitely have that the northern peak correspond to the northern clump in the X-ray emission, um, to the northern structure radio structure we see associated with the BCG, but also with one of the um, northern uh, peak in a weak lensing map. The same thing for the second, for the southern one, we definitely see a second halo, and in the case of the X-ray. We see that correspond to the extent to the south, the kind of like you know low surface brightness, one, and you know we see cor rough correspondence with the secondary structure in the radio, but also uh, with the uh, secondary peak in the mass with a bit of offset, and this is important because overall what it's telling us is that this is clearly a merger. So this is kind of like solving the problem, like okay maybe this is a relaxed system that was that we had before, um, but it's. The, the, the question we still have, like what's the specific state of this merger, whether these are a pre-merger phase, and this is consistent with the fact that we, we see two SZ halos. Because um, in the case of a post-merger scenario, we would expect like the pressure to be mixed uh, uh, and like, you know, we we'll probably see more like kind of like, you know, a skewed distribution in the pressure instead of like, you know, two in distinct halos. Um, but the problem is like, you know, we, will look, we should also expect a stronger 
um, uh, uh, signal from like a potential shock that is generated by the merger activity. Um, so the other option is that actually this kind of like a post core passage uh, case where like you know the the cluster already interacted. Uh, but of course, this would require a really large impact parameter. So just really you know, the two clusters missing each other um, and you know, like you know, <laughs> have like very uh, small interaction. And this will be actually interesting because it will fit also this scenario here presented by the weak lensing macro where we do see um, separation between the halos uh, traced by the SC and then gas and the dark matter. So most of the mass where we do see like this um, small offset, similar, but of course in different direction, different configuration than the bullet. Um, and this is kind of it. So we a lot of open questions. And talking about the bullet though, that was actually the other point I wanted to show you. Um, because of course the, 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 the study like about SP2106 was still a bit on the bullet biology side, it was still more like about finding halos. Um, smaller ones, <laughs> uh, but still like, you know, really just getting like, you know, the bulk of the signal. Um, having high resolution observation with the SZ effect means also really pushing like, you know, on what we can do with like ICM studies. Um, and so in this case, uh, we targeted um, the very nose of the shock front in the bullet cluster. Uh, so yeah, this is the shock front. This is basically the remnant of the smaller um, uh, cluster just you know merging with the larger system and um, and which is also the bullet that just gives a name to the cluster and uh, the reason why i wanted to do this is to try to get information on what's going on in terms of like you know um a, a heating of the electrons and ions and in shocks so what we see in uh, in the universe is that in the presence of shocks ions and electrons get um get heated to different temperatures and this is just in a collection of, of measurements from systems that are not galaxy clusters. Uh, so like, you know, this, for example, like um, supernova remnants we have here, uh, or like um, the ionosphere of Saturn. And we definitely see, I mean, the, the main point of this, of this uh, plot is that like, you know, the, the ratio between the electron and ion temperature is always below one, well, mostly below one. Um, so the question is like, you know, could this have, is this what happens like in cluster two or this is not the case? Um, Cause like the two scenarios like, you know, is like either this, so they're, they're the same. So we need basically a mechanism for like, you know, really heating up um, electrons and ions to the same temperature instantaneously, or we just go for like, you know, slower um, uh, scenario where basically have a first adiabatic heating of the the electrons and ions and of course the ions get heated way more than electrons as they carry as they carry most of the kinetic energy of the gas um and then a slow liquidity rate to like you know what we expect from shock theory um to like you know the same temperature the reason why this is important is because like you know uh for example like you know i, I found out like this just a few weeks ago actually probably is something like you know uh people will know but for example, cosmological simulations are based on the assumption that like ions and electrons should share the same uh, temperature and just assuming the same population of, of particles. Maybe not all of them, but just the one we probably have in Fiesta. Um, but the thing is like, you know, first knowing that we have different temperature will mean that what we're measuring from like, you know, Etsy or X-ray is not just exactly the same value, for example, for ions, because what we're measuring is just electrons. And like, you know, in the Etsy it's just electron pressure or from X-ray is mostly electron density. Um, this thing said, the main problem with galaxy cluster is that when we go to measurement, um, we have completely contradictory results. So we, we don't know what's going on. Um, we have the bullet again, um, and previous X-ray studies show that basically there is actually um, evidence for instantaneous seeding of the electron. So we have perfect equilibration of the uh, two uh, particle um, population at the shock front itself. The other possibility, and that was found for uh, Ableton 2146, um, is that we may have collision equilibration. And um, and then on the other hand, we also have Able 520, we're like, you know, where the like evidence for this internal seeding. The reason I won is actually uh, told by um, Craig, that I saw like four. 
uh, if I correct me if I'm wrong, correct, but actually we're going like even going beyond like you know sometimes really liberation, we're like, you know, kind of like a, a, a um, uh, reverse like you know um, behavior for like you know internet activities. But the main point, like you know, we don't know what's going on here. So the thing, like you know, let's point like you know our see telescope like on the textbook example of a bow shock and see what we find. Um, just let me just go back for a second. Um, so of course, like as I mentioned before, X-ray is only measuring density, right? We like a bit of correction for temperature. Um, but of course, the density should be the same across the shock front for both the ions and electrons. So otherwise, we have like you know electric uh, currents on huge scales, uh, and it's not you know <laughs> stable. Uh, so what's like this thing is going to impact is mostly uh, temperature, and then of course as a product of density and temperature pressure. So we can measure the two things either from X-ray through temperature measurements or through SD through pressure measurements. This is what we did indeed. Um, so basically what we found, uh, we used basically the pressure jump by the shock front as a measurement for this, and in particular the Mach number, which is um, just, you know, giving out the ratio of like the, the speed of the shock and the system with respect to the, to the sound speed in the, in the intercluster room. Um, that is related to the pressure jump. But the main point is like, you know, when we assume a model that has um, instantaneous equilibration in the thermodynamic profile, we have a, a huge discrepancy between the SZ value and the X-ray value here. But, uh, this just got wrong, but <laughs> when um, we just assume we said um, uh, collision equilibration, so like first adiabatic heating, we have a, almost a perfect agreement between SZ and X-ray. So we just call and, you know, but still, you know, there are a lot of open questions regarding geometry of the, of the shock front. It's still like, you know, something we're, you know, trying to understand. Um, and, um, but the most important point here is that like for studying these, we basically trace scales of zero like eight kiloparsecs. It is really small, like for a galaxy cluster, we just, you know, go to like, you know, hundreds of kiloparsecs in general. And this has been allowed because we really trace a very tiny scales like across the shock front. Um, but I don't know if you, you know, notice this, but I'm not showing any Alma image of the bullet cluster at this point. Cause like actually, you know, observing galaxy cluster with Alma uh, had many problems <laughs> with that. Um, so let's see at data uh, here. This is not working. This is working now. So this is actually the image in the direction of the shock front, which is definitely different from what we see in the X-ray. Uh, the reason for this is like, you know, it, it's in how basically Altman um, looks at uh, galaxy cluster. And just to clean up a bit of noise and just make it clear, uh, this is basically what we see. So we just basically really, really looking at the jump uh, in the direction of the shock front, and we're just missing all the information on our scales. The reason it's really important, just going through this for if like for the probably just a few of you are not familiar with interferometry, uh, but you know we have uh, we start from a simulation of a galaxy that was like made by Song Yao Zhang in uh, Chicago, and what we what the, our interferometer is doing just observing to the Fourier form of this cluster. So let's say the Fourier form, but of course it's doing this only with a discrete number, a limited number of antenna. And so let's just take like a limited number of wave uh, mode. So we take these modes and we just inverse Fourier um, back to image space. And this is what we get basically. So from a, a real proper cluster image, we just go to basically only to get um, all the discontinuities and the small scale features that are in the um, ICM. So with Alma, we're really just getting to very, very small scale, but completely missing the large scale. So we will need another instrument and getting <laughs> to something we probably know to get both of the words. So both high resolution, but also good sensitivity to large scale to really get like, you know, proper modeling of uh, the Sinatodovich effect. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to introduce you to this guy here. Um, so the whole point I want to stress uh, is this. Uh, so this is the torque function of uh, the average torque function for mass and uh, which is you know, an instrument on um, the GBT. The main point is like, you know, really what we're getting here is like compared to Alma that we're having a fork mid full with, um, field of view, getting like, you know, basically kind of like a unity um, sensitivity up to those scales. 
but also really high resolution, getting busy in nine or seconds. Um, I want to say, like, you know, this, like, you know, Alma, of course, could go to sub seconds um, information too. The problem with that is that A, we won't get like you know, um, unity transfer function. So it would be really hard to understand what's missing in terms of flux on all the scales. And two, of course, it will miss a lot of large scales. It would be really hard to get like the large scale component, which is really important for large scale stru structures as um, uh, clusters. And in general, basically what we have is that it's really hard to you know, fit a single cluster inside like a single field of view of Alma. Um, which is not the case for Mustang 2 and for GPT. And so the thing is like, you know, I work a lot on Alma data and I'm still kind of like, you know, getting into analysis of Mustang 2. So from now on, it's just, you know, a very quick um, gallery of nice pictures with a bit of like, you know, taste of what probably is going to happen soon. Um, so the, the, the first idea is that the first, so we had basically three clusters uh, showing evidence for um, either collisional or instantaneous heating. So, we had the bullet from Alma. Let's go for another one. And we target like, you know, just last semester, um, this cluster here is ABLE 520. It's basically called a, a train wreck cross cluster. Um, the reason for this is that basically, this is way more complex than uh, the bullet cluster. So we can see here, there are like, you know, basically at least three main clumps of um, galaxies that are traced by like, you know, the optical luminosity in yellow. So in on this image where the green is the X-ray emission. Um, so what's happening is basically we have a collection of sub that are doing a merger same time. Um, and in this case, it's also really complex uh, dark matter distribution. I will skip about that. Uh, I will focus on the heating process. So we targeted this, and uh, this is like the X-ray image. Uh, this is the shock front that we've been studied. And this is just you know, the profile, temperature profile, just you know, Clearly, putting here um, a reference to the fact that you know the, the instantaneous model, which is this step function here, is favored over the adiabatic one. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning, though, um, that um, extra observation may have problems with like temperature. The thing is, like you know, in the specific case, Chandra is has like limited sensitivity to really high temperatures for like yeah, I measure like in you know, a band, observ observational band. And the thing is, like, so, so roughly speaking, uh, probably like, you know, extreme people will just, you know, <laughs> not like this. Uh, but like, you know, above like, you know, 15, 20 kV, everything is kind of like, you know, hot in the same way. Um, so these measurements, like, of course, like, will need, will require, like, you know, more information from pressure because then with true density and pressure, we can recover temperature and understand what's going on there. And at the moment, the only thing we have is a nice map. Um, this is just an image of the same cluster on the left, but true as the observation with Mustang 2. And to me, it's amazing, like one of the best as the image I ever saw, um, ever seen. But like, you know, the thing that we can see definitely, it's the most important part, like, and it's important for this talk is this arc here. This red part is basically tracing the shock front and just to ease the view. Um, these are the contours from the X-ray image. Um, and what it's telling us, like, you know, We'll have to go through the analysis. Uh, we don't know what, what we'll find. Uh, but the main point is like, it's really telling us that Mustang 2 will be used and GBT could be used for really just tracing a galaxy cluster with like an amazing resolution, but to really get into like you know, shock physics. Um, and you know, we can connect this ability of like you know, looking at shocks with like you know, the fact that we can go to high redshift, no problem, with like you know, high redshift systems. Uh, and this is something I, you know. Emily has been, he's heavily involved in, um, this is a real high redshift system. And it was fun because actually we found out, you know, about this, like, you know, during the last proposal, like round writing proposal, we just serendipitously, serendipitously found a shock from, maybe, we don't know. Um, just to <laughs> make everything here. So this should be like a shock from, we don't know yet whether like it's really there or not, or you just, you know, going through the analysis and what's important like you know this is definitely a, a emerging system uh, it's been a really study like by um, using like a negative observation channel observations but also if we just take data from speedster like a, well, like a, um, part of the the met cows with the release uh, and also the the, the same catalog really uh, provide like the, the detection the, the first discovery of this cluster you can not only see like a double distribution with pretty similar to what we see for the bullet. 
So just to put like a bit of, you know, uh, let's say strength on the SC, just to do a quick comparison, this was obtained only to like uh, roughly like five hours of integration. So it's kind of like a short duration, but it is like the corresponding X-ray image. So, you know, I tend to go for the SC, of course I'm strongly biased, but this, the, the X-ray image was um, a factor of three or four times longer. And, you know, this is really telling us why we need to go for the SC when we need to go for high redshift. Um, and uh, we want to just you know, really get into ICM physics. In basically, at Epoch said it's basically almost unexplored at the moment. Um, and then, last but not least, so I'm when I start like you know yeah, thinking about this, like say okay, I'm not going to talk only about mergers, but um, actually this is wrong. But <laughs> I forgot like to correct this. Um, this is not the most massive cluster at redshift zero point um, zero eight. Is among the most massive, uh, but the point is like you know we target also this cluster. Um, the reason why we did this is like yeah, it was one of the most massive above uh, above a shift of 0.8. Uh, but it was interesting that basically it was not detected in Planck before, uh, or like through X-ray observations, for example, like in Rosette or like in you know, XMM. And the only mention we had before is like you know uh, this as an agent. Um, but it's one of the most massive ones. So it's kind of really weird. And um, our goal is just trying to understand why it was, this, this was missed. Um, and at first, like the basic idea was like, you no, know, maybe this is going to be something like the Phoenix cluster, Phoenix cluster, kind of like a you know, really famous one. Um, and that was also missed um, and misclassified, misclassified as an AGN at first. Um, and, and then it's famous because it's, it's the only one that show like you know, seems to have like a cooling flow. So basically, when we like the AGN that I mentioned before is not supporting the um, the, the structure anymore, and it's like you know uh, violently cooling down and just you know, collapsing for the center. Um, but as I say, like you know, at first I was thinking that you know I I don't, I don't want to talk only about merger, but what turns out uh, turns out is that. When we see at the SC distribution, we see a strong asymmetry. As we saw, like a you know, strong asymmetry in the ICM uh, morphology means there's probably um, something going on in terms of like an emerging activity. And accidentally, this you know uh, actually correspond to a really strong elongation in terms of like you know uh, galaxies along like, exactly this direction. So probably another merger once again. <laughs> really kind of fun of that. Um, and yeah, this is it. Kind of like you know, as I mentioned, like you know. I'm working on this with a lot of people and most of them are here um, and really, you know, like saying all of them, and it's kind of like, you know, my last slide on Mustang 2. And I hope I really convince you that, you know, high Z is cool um, and uh, Z is cooler and we can really go for like, you know, going for high Z observations, high resolution observation with the SC effect for tracing into cross stream medium. In a way that is complementary and independent of X-ray observations. I think we really, really need both of them for just getting like kind of a, a full view uh, understanding of what's going on in, in class, galaxy clusters but it's really like you know kind of opening a new uh, possibility to like really understanding uh, how you know um, the thermal history of our universe and that's it for me well thank you luca it was very interesting to hear about your work and hear about the exciting science that can be done uh, with Mustang too, really exciting. So um, I'll take, we'll take some time here to uh, have some questions. And I see um, that someone has already raised their hand. Yes, please uh, ask your question. Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So I thought you were talking to somebody else, but okay. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the nice presentation, uh, which is very interesting. I'm more curious about the ALMA side. So your ALMA observation, does that have a the multiple array configuration? So it has enough, you know, the, the largest angular scales to cover or so you, you only have a the limited, you know, the, the, the one, for example, array configuration. So you don't really cover the largest scale. So I was confused. So if you okay. have a multiple configuration, then how do you find, you know, what is your impression? Do, do you still have a trouble to achieve a uniform sensitivity across a, the, you know, the, the angular scale? 
So the problem, the problem with album observations is um, we don't really have to go for like you know, ACA observations and compact array, uh, comp the configuration of Alma, because like you know adding more configurations and high resolution, so like a more extended one, uh, it would just add a lot of information on small scales that generally they're not the one that are relevant for SC science, just for a matter of like match between the angular scale of a cluster with the you know maximum recoverable scale by Alma. So the best strategy in general is to go for a combination of ACA for just really getting the largest scale possible with Alma as like you know a unique array. I mean, um, and then the compact configuration by 12 meters. Uh, in that case, you can have a fairly good coverage of the scales you're interested in when doing SC science. But the problem, is like you know, is still going to be it's still far from being like a, a unity across the, the the range of scales that are probing, and it's just for how uh, you know how is observing and um, yeah and like you know just like you know UV sampling, and then your point is also um, you know like an integration time, um, it's yeah we we generally have pretty good pretty good coverages uh, of the UV plane for what we can get of course. Because like you know, forgetting like to as the observation, we really really need uh, long uh, exposures, um, uh, and with long, I mean definitely above like you know, um, I would say <laughs> like you know anything above like five to ten hours for sure. Um, so you, you'll still get you're you're still getting a fairly good coverage of the UV plane, but still it's not good enough, and mostly because you're just completely missing of course like large scale information. I see. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, while people are asking, thinking of questions, um, so Luca, the last Mustang 2 image that you showed, is that the one that we've been observing this semester that we observed yes. on, on Saturday night? Okay. On Saturday. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's looking really good. Yeah, yeah, looking for the like, like, yeah, and that's actually what I'm saying. Like, you know, with people contributing to this, it's just you know, um, this has been like observed like you know, by Emily actually on Saturday, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I also had another question on yeah the bullet cluster analysis you did, um, comparing Alma the Alma data to the um, SZ. You had the two histograms um, of the X-ray and the um, SZ data? Yep. Yeah, that, yeah. okay. So this, so what we're looking at here, is it is it different um, aspects of the shock front that we're seeing in the different wavelengths? Or yeah, or is it the different heating mechanisms? Yeah, so I'm just- So yeah, the, um, yeah, I went fascinated like, cause I, I checked like it was going late. Basically the main point here is that uh, we have to correct for the, the temperature that we're going to have for different scenarios and of course pressure. The point is like you know, when, you, when you do that for X-rays, the only thing you have to correct is how you uh, you convert from surface brightness to density jump. Um, and then it's kind of like going to be like a minor effect. For uh, the SC, what's going to be is like you're going to have A, a different pressure jump. So if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you have the same Mach number, um, in the two scenarios, you're going to have a different like jump in pressure, but also you have to consider different corrections to the relativistic effect. So there's something I can, yeah, I'm not mentioning here, but it's important because of course, like you have a different temperature, different temperature is going to have like different effects. And the main point here is basically what we're doing is for both the X-ray and the Z effect, we're just assuming a temperature profile following the prescription from the different heating scenario. So just as a game, okay, we're just measuring this pressure jump and adding a temperature, like, you know, kind of like, not a posteriori, it's like why we model, but it's not constrained by the data, it's just imposed like, you know, uh, by the model. And then of course, that's why we're correcting both the X-ray and the Z just in two ways. Okay, interesting, thank you. Okay, uh, any other final questions? Uh, if you don't mind, can I ask one oh, additional question? Yes. So, sorry, this is not related with your talk, but uh, I was very curious about your Mustang images. One of the cluster that shows a, the several, you know, the very compact emission, which doesn't seem to have any counterpart in the optical images. Am I? Yeah, I was wondering what are, what are those? It's not that uh, the one of the clusters 
it's I forgot the name. I think it's the last one. Um, the, the, before that, yeah, if you keep going. Oh, let me go here. I think this is one, maybe. No. Uh, maybe it was Alma. Maybe this one? I don't know. The, uh, I guess, no, it's just a couple, maybe between slide then and 10 and 20, I guess. Okay. So uh, let's see. Not that. Uh, uh, I will just go through that and just say stop. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just can't recall the, what was. Oh yeah, I mean the, uh, but that cluster, I mean the, if you go to the this one. slide, not the one, the one more. Yeah, that cluster, uh, you have a Mustang okay, images right. of that, right? Yes, yes, I uh, will show that in a bit. Curious, yep. Yeah, what, what are those three dots? Uh, these are like, you know, just um, millimeter bright sources. Uh, so there is, this one corresponds to this one actually. And this two, there is no clear corresponding X-ray, but it's just basically um, AGN, uh, we are like, you know, galaxies uh, in the field. I'm not sure whether they are like part of the cluster or not, but definitely like, you know, in the field. Um, and, you know, at, for Mustang, this is basically like, you know, they're they act as like point like sources, basically. So you're just contaminating uh, the entire field. And there's actually another one here too, uh, but <laughs> kind of like faint-ish. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, but no, this is, yeah. The, basically the blue part here is the SC, which I think we should- Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to comment, like I, I read like in a uh, quick comment from Sigurd. Yes, um, so the, the act map that I showed before for the bullet is really elongated um and that's basically just because like you know uh, it's just a projection it's just a matter of projection and of course when you just take the right one it's going to prove a bit and it's just going to see that there is some squeezing of the um, sz in the right direction of just saying okay look there is like a, a shock which is similar to the one you have for the bullet um but of course yeah uh, in that case it's more like you know really understanding that you have a merger going on and not really uh, getting the details but th thanks for the comment anyway Okay, hey, excellent. Well, thank you again, Luca, for sharing with us sure. your work. Um, for everyone else, uh, next week we have um, a lunch talk and then, uh, then on Thursday and then next Wednesday we have another uh, cluster science and Mustang 2 talk. So everyone's going to learn very much what Mustang 2 is all up to in studying clusters. So thanks for joining everyone. See you next time. <laughs>